Thank you everybody for joining us. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. On behalf of USAID, Feed the Future, and AgriLinks, I welcome you to our webinar using satellite data as climate adaptation strategy to enhance food security. I am Michael Saltz with AgriLinks. Before we begin, let me orient you to the BlueJeans platform. On the right side of your screen, you'll see most of your controls. First, please use the chat to introduce yourself and network with colleagues from around the world. To ask questions, please use the Q&A button on the bottom right. Please indicate who your question is for. Feel free to upvote questions you want answered. You can ask questions throughout the webinar. Our Q&A session will be at the end of the webinar. If the presentation is too small on your screen, you can use the slide bar at the bottom of the window to adjust the view. Lastly, we are recording the webinar and will email you the post-event resources as soon as they are available. You can also find the resources at agrolinks.org when they are ready. Thank you for your attention. I will now pass it to USAID's Barbara Goldapsas. Thank you so much, Michael. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to the AgriLinks webinar, Using Satellite Data as a Climate Adaptation Strategy to Enhance Food Security. I am a Science and Technology Policy Fellow doing government service through the American Association for the Advancement of Science. I currently am serving as a Resilience and Climate Adaptation Advisor with the Center for Resilience and the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security at USAID in Washington. I previously taught and did research in environmental and public health, and I am the author of The Green Tiger, The Costs of Ecological Decline in the Philippines. I'd like to very much thank AgriLinks for making this webinar possible and for providing the platform to support a community of practice for people, including all of you, who care about development, agriculture, and food security in countries worldwide. So in, in preparing for this webinar, I found myself thinking about the blue marble, which of course is that is the iconic image and one of the earliest images of the Earth that was captured from a spacecraft. It was shot in 1972 from Apollo 17. And the blue marble captured for the first time, of course, that beautiful blue illuminated face of the whole Earth. And for many of us, it also captured its vulnerability. While that beautiful image, the blue marble, may have changed how some of us saw our planet, in those early years of space flight, few outside of NASA and other organizations could have imagined that the, the satellites would one day collect so much data and so frequently that those data would be free and open and that they would transform what we can observe across the globe and what we can measure. As the effects of climate change grow harsher as they are, remote sensing data are becoming even more valuable to our efforts to adapt to those unwanted changes. These data and the images based on them are allowing us to monitor the Earth's surface and oceans and atmosphere and better understand what changes are happening. Satellite data can be used to predict what changes will happen next and where they might happen. They can be used to anticipate problems from drought to fires and give us information to try to prevent them or at least lessen their effects. In today's webinar, we will hear about ways that these data can be used to strengthen food security in the face of climate variability. I'm very pleased to introduce our three speakers. Walter Bathgen is Senior Research Scientist and Director of the Regional and Sectoral Research Program in the International Research Institute for Climate and Society at the Earth Institute at Columbia University. He will be speaking about a collaborative demand-driven approach that uses climate services to inform decisions and policymaking in agriculture. The promise of climate services does is to provide reliable information that can help decision makers at all levels anticipate and plan for climate events. Molly Brown is research professor in the Department of Geographical Sciences at University of Maryland and chief science officer of Sixth Grain Corporation, a US-based di digital agriculture company. She will be speaking about ways to support the provision of agricultural insurance to small landholders 
at very low cost. Transferring risk in this way can help prevent smallholders from backsliding into poverty when climate shocks hit. Faisal Muayn Khmer is remote sensing specialist at ISIMODE, the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development in Kathmandu, Nepal, where he leads the food security and climate services work. He will be speaking about collaborative efforts to help national institutions use earth observation data in planning for food security through the USAID and NASA SERVIR program in the Hindu Kush Himalaya region in South Asia. As Michael said, after the presentations, we will have about 30 minutes for questions. Please remember to put your questions in the Q&A, which we will monitor. Um, without further ado, I'm very pleased to open the session with Walter Bajan. Thank you, Barbara. Good day, everybody. So today, thank you for the invitation. And today I will be talking very briefly about climate services and how they serve agriculture. Next slide, please. And um, the, the importance of this concept is that we are very good in generating data, but what we really want is that that data ends informing decisions at the farmer level, at the ministry level, at the government level. And so one way that we found it very useful to organize our work is based on these four pillars of climate services. Climate services uh, include these four processes, the generation of climate information, but then the translation of that climate information into something that is relevant for the sectors, in this case for agriculture, Third pillar is transferring that translated information to the right stakeholders. And finally, using that translated information for supporting decisions and supporting policy. Next slide, please. Starting with, uh, with the generation, the pillar of generating data. One, one of the challenges that we find, of course, when we work in developing countries is the challenge of data poverty. That is, Next slide, please. A lot of situations where, for different reasons, countries are not able to record in continuously the weather observations. We have cases like the upper left, when a political conflict results in almost complete elimination of observations during a number of years, or what is shown in the lower left, which is more common, and this is a constant declining in investment in the weather observation system. Next slide, please. And we end in a situation like shown in this graph, where this is for the whole of Africa, the number of weather stations reporting information to global data sets. And you can see that in the 90s, there were 4,000 weather stations reporting data to these global data sets. And now the number of weather stations that are going into those global data sets has been reduced drastically. Next slide. So what is the solution for that? What are we doing? We're, we're trying to work with our local national collaborators to develop the best possible climate data set. And we start first, next slide. We start with uh, observations and here there is a very important process of gaining trust from the local meteorological services. We work with the med services and develop their capacities to do quality control. And, and by strengthening the capacity to establish climate forecasts, weather forecasts, historical analysis, and by developing those activities, we gain the trust. That's a very important issue here. And by gaining that trust, we are able to work with a number of weather stations that sometimes is 10 or 20 or 30 times larger than the, num the number of weather stations that those countries report to global organizations. Next slide. Then we combine those observations with satellite-derived tools, satellite products that can estimate things like rainfall. Next slide. And by combining those, then we generate 
the best possible data sets, which are, for example, 30 years of graded daily data at the resolution that can be as good as five kilometers. Next slide. Now, once that we have that best possible climate data set, we can do lots of things, including historical analysis, learning from the past. For example, understanding in the past, next slide, which were the years where we had problems with droughts, next slide please, and identifying those drought years and trying to understand what were the interventions that worked the best. What were interventions that didn't work? In this case, I'm showing satellite data, vegetation indices, NDVI or EVI, indices that show the health of the vegetation in the field. Next slide. And this information, in addition to learning from the past, understanding what worked and what didn't, they're very good uh, information for developing, for example, index insurance products. Next slide, please. Now, this is on the generation. What happens in the very important other three pillars, the translation, the transfer, and the use? Next slide. I'm going to use an example of how we use this approach of climate services to assist a government in developing policy. And the example that I'm going to use is the process of declaring an official emergency, for example, due to drought. Next slide. As you probably know, declaring an official emergency is a pretty messy process. Typically, the countries start suffering the drought and they go in the very last minute looking for financial resources to help farmers. It's a very inefficient and ineffective process. It, it, typically, the countries do not use objective tools and they're subject to criticism, for example, very often people believe that the regions that are getting help uh, before are the ones that are supporting the government, some things like that. Next slide. So what we try to do using this climate services approach is how can we develop an objective tool to inform this messy process of declaring official emergency? Next slide. What we did is we started working with the National Agricultural Research Institute in Uruguay. This is an example from Uruguay, a drought that happened in 2015. And we started working with our local partners in developing soil water content information. So this is an example of translating the data on rainfall, data on temperature, and converting that climate information into something that makes more sense for agronomic users. So what we did is we just performed simple soil water balances per soil type. Next, next slide. We, use, we need to do this by soil type because, as you know, the, the, um, the ability to store water of the soil varies a lot with the properties. Next slide. If we have a shallow soil, soil it's like having a small bucket that can hold little water, if we have a deep soil, we have a big bucket, and therefore, next slide, the soil water balance has to be done by soil type. And there is a small map showing the different soil types, the darker the color, the more, uh, the larger the amount of water that the soil can hold. Next slide. But the decisions at the government level are not done are not made, made by soil types. They're made by administrative units, by county, by province, by district. Next slide. So what we did is we converted these soil water balances based on soil types into soil water balances by county. And we provided this information every 10 days to the government, to the Ministry of Agriculture, to the emergency system. Next slide. And by early May of that year, Next slide, please. By early May, the government declared officially emergency in four provinces in the East. So this was based on a very objective way. It was very defensible. It was, uh, and uh, the nice thing is that in the, in the next two droughts that happened in that country, the same tools were used. So now we're happy to say that this has been established as policy, as policy in that country. 
Next slide. The other important issue that we learned, the other lessons that we learned in our almost 30 years of working in this type of uh, issues, informing decisions and informing policies, is that we go to these projects with a mental linear model, when we have the institutions that are generating information, and at the other end, on the right, we have the end users that we want to inform. This is an example where we are trying to produce climate information or climate related information to help farmers' decisions and to help policies at the ministry level. The reality when we go to the field is that we understand that the networks, next slide, the networks that are really present in the field are very different. They're a lot more complicated than this linear model. And one thing that we learned is that we really need to understand how these networks work. We need to understand where we have in that network, we have very weak links or links that do not exist. We need to understand where are the key links. And one thing that we learned is that we have to be conducting research in this type of networks as robust as we conduct network in climate, in agriculture, we need good social science researching, understanding this type of networks if we really want to inform decisions and policy. Next, please. Now, so far, I have been talking about mainly climate or climate-related information. This is very useful, but if we really want to inform actual decisions, actual policies, we need to integrate this information to other types of information. There are no decisions and no policies that are based on one dimension, that are based on, on precipitation. Decisions and policies are typically based on integrated knowledge on things like climate, prices, farm characteristics, what policies are in place, cultural characteristics, personal preference, and many others. So we need to integrate this information if we want to inform decisions and policy. Next, please. And for that, we need two things. We need tools that are able to integrate that different types of information, decision support systems, and we need people, very important, we need people that are able to integrate that knowledge. And this is something I will be glad to discuss in the Q&A session, but this is something that academic institutions have to learn. We need to start forming, educating integrators of knowledge if we want to inform policies and decisions. So what do we do with these decision support systems? Next slide. We combine the climate information with other types of information, crop varieties, planting dates, soil types, prices, uh, technologies, and we use very useful tools like crop simulation models Next slide. To answer questions of like the what if questions. What happens if we have an El Nino year? Or what happens if we are introducing a new technology? Or what happens if the crop prices change? What happens if we have a new insurance policy available? What happens if we, what would be the impact of establishing a new credit line? Next slide. The nice thing of this approach is that it provides Ag agronomists, advisors, extension workers, ministry advisors, provide quantitative information that they can use with their stakeholders in, in participative approaches, and then co-create solutions to these questions of what if, what would happen if. The important thing is this particip participative approach and this co-creation with the stakeholders of this type of solution. Next slide, please. So, final comments. Next slide. On the pillar of generation, first of all, climate services, it includes the whole process. We do not have a climate services if we don't have the whole process of generating relevant information, translating that climate information into something that is agronomically relevant, transferring that information to the right stakeholders, and then using it to inform, to support farmer decisions or government policy. Next. 
On the generation pillar, I told you that one of the main challenges we find in the developing world is data poverty. Solution for that challenge is gaining the trust of our local partners, strengthening their capacities, and, and being able to generate the best possible climate uh, data sets, combining observations and satellite data. Next, please. On the translation, the importance of, of understanding that if we convert climate information into agronomically relevant information, that is a lot more effective in forming decisions or policy. And that becomes a lot more effective if we do that using from the beginning a participatory approach. We work with agronomists, with farmers, with extension agents, with ministry, Advisors, advisors to understand the problems, to understand their decision systems, and to then try to provide or develop together the information needed to support decision. Next, in the in the transfer, the, the importance is and understanding these very complicated networks that I was mentioning to you, but also being. Uh, ensuring that we integrate this climate knowledge with other information that are critical for making decisions, economic information, cultural information. And the, we need two things, again, for this. We need people that are able to integrate information, and we need to ensure that our education systems are forming this type of integrators. And two, we need tools. We need good decision support systems that are able to combine these different types of data sets and provide understandable and actionable information. Next. And finally, in the actual use of this information, in translated and transferred information, we need to start by understanding the needs, not start with a supply approach. I have this information and I know that this should help you make decisions. No. What is your decisions? What are the decisions that you are trying to make? What is the policy that you are trying to develop? Understand, start with the needs. Then understand these very complicated networks through which net knowledge flows. We know where is the generation and we know where are the end users. Between those two agencies, typically very complicated networks that we need to understand. And we, we need to ensure that this, all of this process is done with a continuous capacity development of our partners and with a co-production approach. And I think that's the next, I think that's the last one. Yes, thank you. So I'll remain available for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Walter. That was very interesting, and um, you really set the stage for the, um, for the next two panelists. And next, we will hear from Molly Brown, who will be speaking about microinsurance for agriculture. Hi. So um, I am, I was asked to talk about microinsurance for agriculture. I'm from the University of Maryland and Six Green. Next slide, please. So um, Walter really did a great job explaining what data and systems need to be in place. But for small growers, what they really need is protection against specific perils for um, in exchange for a premium payment. So you all know what insurance is. It's where you pay out every month or at a specific time and to uh, protect against a particular risk. And then if that risk occurs, like your house burns down, you get a payout, which will help you recover from that problem. So microinsurance targets low-income farmers, um, and it usually differs from regular insurance, regular, uh, how shall I put it, regular agricultural insurance, because it covers a different set of risks. It has a different, uh, very specific delivery channels. It has much lower premiums, 
and which is that payment that you that you give and then the documentation required for each claim is very different next slide so um, for agriculture insurance there are two different types there's the indemnity products and the index based products indemnity products usually cover very specific um, insurance uh, are very specific perils. So for example, you can get hail insurance or flood insurance if you're in a floodplain or frost if you have an orchard and you have a frost, it can kill, can literally remove all of the flowers and you will get zero crop at the end. There's also multi-peril crop insurance, which is a yield guarantee. This is where a very um, expensive, needless to say, insurance where you submit your yield history, all of your management plans, your um, your uh, all of your loan information, an entire suite of data products, which can be uh, up to hundreds of pieces of information for each field. You can get a then you pay the insurance premium, and at the end of the season. If you do not hit your target because of uh, drought or flood or a particular, any kind of risk whatsoever, if you can show that your yield did not reach the target, then you get a payout. And then there's also accident mortality stock and in, livestock insurance. There are many other indemnity products I'm not mentioning here. Then we have index based insurance. This is where you are insuring. For example, weather-based, where you have ground, where you have station data or remotely sensed weather variables. So if it does not rain a minimum of 500 millimeters in your area, you get a payout. And that payout can be a set amount or it will vary. And I will show you how those insurance products are created. There's also area yield insurance, which uses a statistical sampling of um, the amount of yield that happened in a particular region where you go out and you do crop cuts and it's like one by one meter at, across a, a sampling zone, that sample is set up before you, the insurance is offered and it allows for payout based on yield, but you do not need to provide all that submission of history as in with the indemnity products. And then finally, there's index insurance products which use remote sensing to monitor cropping or pasture conditions. In the United States, we have a, um, an index insurance for uh, growers based on rainfall and vegetation who are using pasture to um, support their livestock. Next slide. Okay, so for index insurance for smallholders, this was a product developed specifically to support smallholder farmers who want to buy hybrid seeds, fertilizers, other inputs, but they and they know how to use them, but they face severe risks in getting loans, which can support their their investment in these seeds because of the variability of rainfall. So if you have a a risk in your particular area of one bad year out of five, it will keep the yield from being high for a particular highly productive um, rower in four years that has really good rainfall because of that risk of, of failing on uh, their loans. And so index insurance allows these growers to, in places with underdeveloped credit systems or um, uh, uh, less developed technological uh, implementation. So it allows these farmers to utilize technologies, get loans and increase productivity without risking their investment if the weather happens to be bad in a particular year. So the index insurance innovation is that it ensures the weather, not the crop. So if the, if the grower purchases insurance, if they don't, if they fail to plant at all, they will still get the payout. Um, the trigger uses a threshold of remote sensing of rainfall or vegetation, typically, and it provides only a partial protection. It is not yield insurance. It is 
ensuring whether or not there's adequate rainfall or not too much rainfall over a particular period. It's also very inexpensive because there are no there are no insurance agents. You don't go out and look at the fields. It, it's an automatic payout. You set up the system, you pay your indemnity, and then if you get if you meet the threshold, you'll get a payout. And there's no um, uh, site visit whatsoever. Next slide. So I'm going to give some examples of an index insurance using remote sensing-based rainfall that Walter so kindly introduced previously. One, it, a, a very well-known one is an Ethiopian weather insurance products called the R4 insurance, which is based on satellite-derived rainfall called CHIRPS, which is derived, uh, generated by the University of California, Santa Barbara. It's five kilometer resolution. It's from 1981, actually right up to the present. Um, yeah, it actually it is updated every um, five days or so and, avail and is available right up to the present. And it uses a dense network of all available station data, which it does through collaboration with the local MET services. So here I'm going to give an example of how we're planning on adding rainfall, adding vegetation data to the rainfall to capture the impact of disease and pest threats. Next slide. So we are interested in adding the vegetation observations to rainfall-based weather insurance because of the advent of desert locust, fall armyworm, and other pests which have greatly reduced yield, even in periods of really good rainfall across East and Southern Africa. I'm showing a map here, which is from Grow Intelligence, a company based out of the United States, which shows the desert locust impact model, which is a pixel level um, uh, map showing the, the areas which are affected by the desert locust. The, the regions with a high, denser green have a higher impact and it uses vegetation index, the normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI, to in comparison with previous years with similar rainfall to show where the desert locust has severely impacted the amount of biomass on the ground. The darker green indicates the areas that are greater affected. So this approach can be very effective and what we're interested in doing is combining vegetation vigor together with rainfall to provide a more comprehensive target um, and index for uh, growers in East and Southern Africa. Next slide. So when you're designing an index, a commercial index insurance product, you need to um, design that, it, it, you have to focus on how the system will work from research to payment of claims. And the objective is to reduce the basis risk or the lack of relationship between the yield loss experienced by the farmer and the payout. As you might imagine, it's very distressing if you pay your premium, you go and you grow your crop, but you fail to achieve the yield you thought you should because of, for example, a huge locust outbreak, even though the rainfall is good. So when you're designing the product, we, we need to decide what the premium rates and the rate of subsidy, for example, how much does the insurance gonna cost? What's the timing and what are the payouts? Is, is it only for the beginning of the crop, the emergence, or it, will it have different periods when it has different thresholds? Um, what the payments are by each crop and each district, what the triggers are, is it going to be 200 millimeters, 500 millimeters, and does it vary depending on the time, the, the um, different period of, you know, the crop growth stage? Will you carry forward rainfall from phase to phase? And finally, how many phases are there going to be? Two, five, or whatever. So you can see there's a lot of decisions to be made. And they're not particularly focused on the satellite data themselves. They have a lot more to do with the 
when the the issues will be and what the impacts you know when when the crop is most vulnerable to the negative to the weather or the pest threat next slide please so um in this particular macro insurance product we are piloting it in Zambia and Zimbabwe and it is bundled with a product so the payouts the in the insurance premium is part of the cost of seeds or herbicides or pesticides for example and then if the trigger happens the the person buying that that product will either be reimbursed the value of the product or will get a new uh you know a new set of seeds or a new herbicide or pesticide and so this is a unique um a unique product because what it allows us to do is to directly in, invest in the growers who have decided to uh, have higher yields to buy hybrid seeds without having to set up a system with a generic or government supported because this is run by the Syngenta Foundation. Next slide. Next, please. So in this particular design, we have decided to divide the crop growth stage into four different stages, the germination of the, of the maize product, the vegetation, flowering, reproduction, and harvest. Next slide. So there, and next, please. So the, the, uh, the different, there's going to be herbicides that we bundle this insurance with in the germination phase and then insecticides and in vegetation and reproduction and there is no product in that last phase next slide next and next again please so the key risks um for germination is drought and excessive rain and then for the vegetation and reproduction reproductive stages we add pests and diseases as well as um and we're removing excess rain during the flowering and reproduction stage so by combining vegetation with uh, rainfall data we will allow for the um, capturing of the failure of the insecticides to work against fall armyworm or desert locust so that when a grower invests in these products, they're able to get reimbursed if they're if the particular products that they have paid for did not work as intended. Next slide. So the rainfall data products that is used here is the chirps data. And as you can see, it's very similar to um, the it it allows for uh, daily or five day or monthly data um, across all of Africa, next, and also the vegetation data. So here we are using MODIS at 500 meters because the we are matching then the 500 meter MODIS to the um, five kilometer uh, payout scheme with the rainfall. And here we're using the daily MODIS data, which we aggregate up to the same 10 day time step as the rainfall data. And what we do is we, if you could go to the next, we will, we are greening and removing all the non-cropped regions in Zambia and Zimbabwe using very high resolution 10 meter cropped area maps. Unlike rainfall where any amount of rainfall that falls on the surface can be used to measure uh, the sufficiency of um, water in a particular field when you're using vegetation you have to remove the influence of trees of you know bare areas of bushes and we need to focus only on the greenness of a particular cropped area and thus using an annual cropped area map is absolutely essential to providing a good description of the vegetation from uh, 
of a particular field. And this is why Grow Intelligence was using a very high resolution data. And here we use the 10 meter Sentinel to remove the pixels at the MODIS resolution that are not cropped. Next slide. So to conclude, index insurance can reduce the risk and increase grower profitability by encouraging and supporting small smallholders across um, uh, low-income regions to allow them to increase access to agricultural technologies. By increasing the productivities in the good years, you reduce the you're able to um, reduce the financial risk in bad years. So to support the growers who want to buy high but high quality um, uh, inputs, we then bundle the insurance with the inputs themselves and then provide either a direct reimbursement or replacement of the products for the following year um, as the payout. And this is then an example of using satellite data within an agricultural system. And that is all I have. Thank you so much, Molly. And next, um, we will be hearing from Faisal Khmer, who will be speaking about, as you can see, mainstreaming Earth observation for food security and policy formulation in South Asia. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, as mentioned by you earlier, that I work at International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, based in Kathmandu. International Center for Integrated Mountain Development is an intergovernmental knowledge and learning center that develops and shares solutions to empower people in the Hindu Kush Himalayan regions, which extend in eight countries, including Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, India, Myanmar, and Pakistan. This region is a critically important global asset with its water, food, and biodiversity resources. Also, the region is facing many sustainability challenges and stands on the front line of climate crisis. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Yeah, like among several of EC Mode's programs, Sarvir Hindu Kush Himalaya uh, program is one of the key program of EC Mode. Uh, the Sarvir initiative itself is a joint development initiative of NASA, USAID, and its partners in Asia, Africa, and Americas. The, the initiative connects space to village by using Earth observation data to help solve development challenges. Survey improves local and regional capacity on use of Earth observation data that empower decision makers to better address critical issues related to food security, water resources, disaster ecosystem, and extreme weather. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, today I'll be talking about Sarvir Hindu Kush Himalayan region's work related to agriculture and food security uh, in South Asia or Hindu Kush Himalayan regions. They overlap, these are two different names. There are some uh, geographic uh, differences in the, those uh, areas. Like if we talk about uh, uh, conventional technology dominated disciplines like earth observation and satellite remote sensing, they are mostly driven by supply side with little focus on user, which results in disconnect between cutting edge technical products that were developed and the specific needs of the users. To avoid this mismatch, we are following service, service planning approach, which ensures the to actively engage stakeholders and end user while making best use of ICT technologies and earth observation data products. Uh, in this process, uh, the technology side comes from applied science teams from universities, U.S. universities and research centers. And then EC Mode colleagues facilitate customization of technology in local context by engaging with institutions like uh, local agriculture ministries, World Food Program, CD centers, and, uh, and other stakeholders. So that's how we, we capitalize on technology as well as uh, the products derived from uh, those technologies and then try to develop or co-develop a joint solution with local partners. And we also try to translate it into service 
so that when it goes to national agencies, they do not have to struggle with uh, lots of technicalities of remote sensing, GIS, and authorization systems, so that they can run those systems as uh, part of their institutional functions in the form of services. So in in the uh, current Hindu Kush Himalayan region uh, applications, we are mostly focusing on Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. Uh, next slide, please. So as I mentioned that we, we follow a, uh, an approach where need assessment is a primary thing. In our need assessment, we find the scope and need for earth observation based information provisioning for various nature of decisions, including sustainability assessment for long-term policies, decision support tools for seasonal assessment or food security balance sheets, farmer level agriculture advisories, and uh, at last, like the climate risk management and financing. Uh, at EC mode, currently we are working in most of those uh, areas according to the needs expressed by the four, four countries, including Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Nepal, and Pakistan. In my next slides, I'll be uh, giving some uh, engagement highlights as well as some example of use of our work at national and local level. Okay, next slide, please. So I'll, I'll start talking about our work in Nepal, uh, where uh, we, are, uh, we are engaged in strengthening in-season crop assessment to support federal and uh, provincial uh, institu uh, institutions for food security planning and decision making. Uh, we are following core development uh, process. Uh, we started this work somewhere in 2018, and we developed uh, uh, pilot assessment in 2019, where we joined hand with statistics unit of uh, the Ministry of Agriculture, and those results were validated in one district and then approved for larger application in major rice crop production zones for 2020. Interestingly, like uh, we uh, as we entered into the 2020, we developed a joint work plan with the Ministry of Agriculture, but as we move forward, we came across uh, COVID situations where we, uh, we, we are come across new logistical restrictions. And that actually like uh, bothered us for a while, but uh, along with these challenges, it also brought some efficiency in our work when we managed to train field staff through virtual uh, platforms on the use of mobile app, GeoFerry, and some of the uh, uh, crop area estimation tools, which were also supported by George Mason University was our applied science team uh, supporting us in this work. Uh, with this uh, virtual platform and uh, uh, use of those, uh, some of the uh, handy tools like GeoFerry mobile app, we were able to engage with 130 extension staff in a year time. And then we introduced them on mobile app based data collection as well as we introduced them to uh, some of the basic concept of uh, Earth observation based crop monitoring. So uh, uh, while the, we, uh, we, uh, we did this assessment in COVID situation where conventional methods were uh, more tedious to apply, we supported statistics unit of Ministry of Agriculture in estimating final production estimates, as well as it had another interesting use when uh, Planning Division of Ministry of Agriculture used those uh, crop maps for facilitating or uh, uh, planning uh, rice procurement uh, facilities. In the COVID situations, farmers were not able to sell their uh, rice uh, uh, rice product by themselves, and then uh, Ministry decided to facilitate this process and open up new procurement uh, centers. And uh, earlier data with, uh, was uh, being reported at district level, a very large uh, uh, unit to plan in, for, uh, for a spatial planning. But when they had access to wall-to-wall -wall map and sub-district level uh, data, then they were in good position to make their procurement uh, uh, process more efficient. So this is one, and like, uh, please next, uh, next slide. Yeah, like uh, this was uh, the last year, but this year again, we continued this exercise 
our approach uh, what we see that we will continue this exercise for at least 3 years as a as a joint assessment in the meantime we are also develop trying to develop some handy tools which are uh, like partially being operated by the ministry staff and then we expect that after 3 years of uh, joint assessment the ministry will be able to take uh, the, those assessments independently by themselves but as we entered into the second year again we have similar covid situations and uh, we have some limitations of uh, uh, like in person trainings we, we are doing some of the trainings but there are limited and then like uh, we do uh, we we see some lags in uh, uh, handing over uh, all the all the products and services to the ministry but in the meantime like we we are still having some interesting usages of products like like uh, this year was a normal year normal to above normal year uh, rice crop was like pretty well but uh, at the time of the maturity we had uh, severe uh, rainfalls which were very very exceptional in nature and then they made a major damage to the crops so they were never expected uh, i would like to, and then like this uh, having these wall to wall maps and rice area estimate are ready in hand it was possible to to uh, support the government on damage assessment where the government, the government of nepal is planning to provide some some sort of support to local farmers against their damage so this damage is uh, being conducted uh, in field assessment as well as remote sensing based assessment here i need to mention that uh, like uh, in all this process we are having some interesting learnings like for example for uh, monsoon season we are uh, we are operating a uh, extreme weather system we call it high watch which uh, where we uh, window for its operation we defined from uh, may to end of september and uh, those uh, rains have and we expect that like most of the time by the end of september monsoon exits from nepal but this uh, this rainfall happened in october which was more devastated financially more devastating than the in season uh, uh, floods or extreme events so with this thing we we also learned that we need to extend our high watt operation which is a the like a resource intensive uh, uh, climate model which we need to extend until october if we want to associate agriculture damages in this process so this is the kind of like joint learning uh, which is going on and we are also trying to translate these processes into services we expect that uh, over period of time that uh, this uh, government is also like uh, uh, ec mode survey team and uh, government we are learning together and uh, we hope that with this kind of joint uh, close collaboration will be able to mainstream uh, this uh, in season assessment uh, in the ministry of agriculture next slide please next slide please it didn't move from my side okay thank you so another example as part of the climate risk management solutions the regional drought monitoring and outlook system facilitate data analysis and aggregation for informed agriculture planning and decision making in four target countries uh in terms of use uh, nepal's uh, national agriculture drought watch is linked to agriculture advisory processes which are being conducted by national agriculture information uh, management project in bangladesh and pakistan national agriculture search councils are using for their seasonal planning processes this is very important to mention that there are fewer seasonal scale uh, products available in this region so this uh, rdmos is one of the like uh, very suitable product where seasonal assessment is being produced on drought in addition to regular use for national drought uh, products a world food program is using it uh, uh, the uh, data drought data products for vulnerability assessment and also for aid assistance planning during the extreme events in one of the uh, 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 a, a highlighted use of uh, drought monitoring and outlook system is its use by general directorate of livestock and animal health in afghanistan they utilize these data products and early warnings for response plan for livestock sector in 
also like uh, these data products and reports were also used for national drought emergency uh, by the government uh, next slide please yeah in context of uh, use of earth observation uh, data products and technologies uh, in pakistan survey rhkh is collaborating with pakistan agriculture research council on updating of agroecological zones of pakistan uh, which is envisaged by the government to to protect the growers and consumers uh, interest uh, the the plan introduces the latest interventions for achieving sustainable agriculture development and reduces the reliance on imported uh, food items the use of remote sensing data products will contribute to clear understanding of cropping patterns and historic changes along with socio economic and ecological impacts of agricultural land use in the region which is very very essential for informed policy making so we are uh, in in pakistan we are in the middle of this process uh, we we are developing uh, crop distribution maps particularly in the areas where crop int intensification is very high and then like uh, crops like sugar cane uh, and cotton has a competition where uh, uh, industrial in incentives are spreading uh, sugar cane in the areas where uh, uh, water table is already very low and irrigation supplies are also shrinking over period of time so so next yeah so these were some examples but uh, like we we are building uh, we are establishing some strong footing in those countries uh, and uh, uh, good capacity on use of earth observation data we we expect that we are we we are not working from scratch there are lots of capacities already exist within the government departments and we capitalize uh, those capacities as well as uh, related functions to put our products and uh, services so that they can be sustained for longer period of time we we uh, we aim to continue working with national institutions and expanding user exchange of services and functions and support the, the adoption process uh, uh, i have not mentioned much about crop insurance as forecast based financing this is one area which where we look forward in coming years we expect that we have uh, uh, sound data products which can be put into the process uh, through engaging mostly engaging with multilateral banks and uh, make it operational in in, uh, in national systems then again in most of the cases like i i mentioned earlier that uh, we were not able to forecast untimely rain which caused loss of damages about 8 billion nepali rupees uh, lost to farmers and then uh, we have uh, uh, new processes loss and damage processes coming up under unfcc we expect that we can also use those tools and technologies to support those uh, processes then again integration of climate uh, for long term uh, policy like we are doing in pakistan we want to uh, expand it on, into the other countries as well as uh, like integration of climate risk and adaptive capacity for formulation of land use policies so that's it from my side thank you next slide and over thank you oh yes, no I, i i skipped it yeah so yeah thank you so just to mention that so this this is another area where we are trying to localize our uh, products for farmer level advisories maybe i think uh, uh, i'm done with my time i'll not get it in on the details of it thank you very much thank you so much and thank you to all the panelists so we're moving now into the question and answer period there's a number of perfect questions in the Q&A and please feel free to add additional questions and also indicate which other <laughs> questions that others have posted interest you the most because we will be taking that into account when we select questions so first we have um from the panel a question from each of the uh, each of the speakers and I'll go in the same order 
as people presented, and then we'll open up and take uh, questions that are posted in the Q and A. Um, so for for Walter, um, it was really interesting, especially to hear your summary of how of the how to generate, translate, and transfer climate knowledge. And um, a question, and this is actually something that was echoed in several of the questions in the Q&A, is could you give a practical example of an integrated and participatory decision support system, including advisors and integrators, that worked with a climate-related um, emergency or challenge? Yeah, sure. So I, I answered that question in the chat, and I, I pasted a link. There is a, a whole approach called PIXA, which is based on the participatory you know, work with, with farming communities. And the idea, the idea there, that this is something that I said we learned in the last 25 years, is that uh, you know, we, we can produce all this great information. We have all these wonderful tools. But uh, if, if we, there's two things that need to happen. One is that we need to be sure that that information is communicated in languages and in ways that is actually actionable. It's not just interesting. It's something that a farmer or an advisor to a minister can effectively use. So what one has to do with how you communicate and how you interact with, with these stakeholders. I would say the most important, and I think this the, this is an issue that we as scientists, as researchers, is a mistake that we very often make, is that we tend to use a supply approach. We, we work a lot in these tools that are wonderful. We spend a lot of energy and time in developing information because we think that that information is useful for farmers or for different stakeholders. The, the truth is that it's a lot more effective when we start not with our supply approach, but understanding what are the problems that we're trying to help solve? What are the decisions that we are trying to inform? What are the challenges that farming communities are facing? And this may sound like a subtle difference, but it's, it makes a huge, huge difference. Is uh, starting with with the problem, starting with the challenge, starting understanding what are the options that farmers have, and, and understanding that sometimes we are developing and communicating a lot of information that is great, but it's not very applicable unless, for example, we have an insurance product like the ones that Molly described, or unless the technology is available to the farmers. And so, I would say, the, first of all, please refer to this work in PIXA that I just pasted in the chat for a general uh, idea, some examples, concrete examples around the world. And, and two, my, at least my personal big lesson is start always with a demand-driven, a problem-driven approach and not with our classical supply-driven approach. Thank you. And a question for Molly. Um, are there additional examples that you could add about how you distribute microinsurance, how you how you make it available to small farmers who may benefit who may benefit benefit from it the most? Thank you. Um, yeah. So additional examples. There are a number of examples. Um, which are, for example, India has a very large index insurance program, which is based on yield. Uh, so it's essentially a, um, a combined satellite derived index combined with yield crop cuts. So it is very large. It's effect, it is funded by the government and it is a very effective um, way of reducing risks over very large areas. The difference between what I presented today and that program and many of these other, like the R4 program in Ethiopia, is that the, 
what we are doing here is innovating and providing an insurance for a particular product. So if you're buying a pesticide, suppose this is a pesticide, part of the the price of this, this uh, particular product is bundled the insurance. So you may be buying this product and may not know that it has insurance with it. So, and if you buy this because of its efficacy, because you're used to buying it, because you're concerned about pests like locusts or, you know, fall armyworm, you buy this and your crop is still destroyed according to the index, you will get a payout. And you may be surprised to get this payout. You may not even be aware that you were buying this and you might get another you know, one of these or a monetary pay. So what I really like about this is that it does not require that you trust your financial system, you understand index insurance or have any idea about weather, right? And it, it, it comes bundled so that you can feel that when you invest in your crop, you buy hybrid seeds, you buy all of the, you know, the entire technology package, you will be supported and protected if there is a huge drought or a big flood or a big, you know, uncontrollable pest outbreak. Thank you. And a question for, for Faisal. What kind of learning is needed at the national or perhaps better the provincial levels to prepare decision makers to use crop assessment data in um, agriculture planning and food security or land use decisions and policies. Thank you. So, uh, yeah, actually decisions are taking place and then it is only another kind of product uh, which has to, uh, to be bring in. So the, the only effort we need to make to promote our observation that to, to identify the value of it like for example, like uh, there are uh, uh, in most in our most recent example, like uh, we were say, seeing a major discrepancy between remote sensing based assessment and the conventional methods assessment. So it was about a difference of 22,000 hectare in a district. So that uh, we conducted a local level, like uh, two weeks back, we conducted a local level consultation workshop where we uh, explained one district in detail that how that uh, what are the drivers or potential reasons for this mismatch once we were able to communicate it more clearly so then they had more trust on authorization database products so like it is uh, the decisions are already taking place it is only another kind of products and then when you are engaged closely with them and then you explain uh, their like uh, both uh, advantages and dis disadvantages together that makes it convenient to to put those products in operation or on main, mainstream usages. Thank you, and I'll turn now to to some of the questions in the in the Q and A. And please keep indicating questions that you find most interesting, which helps uh, which helps guide the the selection. Several people. Um, including Rajendra Upreti and um, and someone who did not give their name, asked about, um, and this question could go for several of you, but how, how can we most make um, small farmers in developing countries um, know about the data? How can we most make it accessible to them? And how can we help them understand the benefits of using technology-led data information systems. I can start with, oh no, go ahead, Molly. I was just gonna say that Walter has given the answer to this, which is we can't convince them because if the data does not solve the problem the grower has, then it is impossible to convince them, right? So what we need to do is to bundle the data and work really hard to make it get up and do something interesting, right? So for example, you can do yield monitoring through the season, but if there's nothing 
no decision you can make when you determine that you're going to have a huge loss, then it really doesn't do anything for you, right? So you have to connect the entire beginning to end. This is one reason index insurance works so nicely is because instead of waiting around, so suppose you pl everyone plants because the season starts and then no rain happens for a month. All of the crops die, right? If you do not have something planned, it's very hard for the government of, you know, Pakistan to come up with their, or Uruguay, as Walter showed, giant pile of money to help all those farmers get more seeds. There has to be more seeds brought in. It's a very complicated thing. If you have insurance, the money is there. It's you're planning on responding to that need, and then you can provide the, the, you know, the seeds or the inputs or whatever it is, timely, efficient, and when it's needed, all organized beforehand. But Walter, you can elaborate on this. Yeah, so first of all, completely support what Molly just said. The, the beauty of, of insure, accessible insurance is that, you know, as opposed to the, to the classical approach of the insurance that is designed to, to compensate for damages. I think in the developing world, this is a tool that allows farmers to invest in the technologies that they know they need to invest. Farmers want to buy good seeds. Farmers want to buy fertilizer. Farmers want to control pests. If they don't do it, it's because they're so worried but getting a bad season that then they're going to get in debt and sometimes have to leave the farm. And so what the insurance does is allow the farmers to do what they know they want to do. And that's the beauty of this insurance. The, the second issue is how, how can farmers access this type of information? I think the a critical actor in that process is the, the person that is in between the generation of knowledge and the application, the use of knowledge. And, you know, the world used to have very powerful extension agents, very good private advisors, uh, NGOs. Those are critical actors here. Those are the people that, that know the problems that farmers are facing. They know the farmers. They personally know the farmers. They know their families. They know the problems they're facing. But they also are able to connect to the institutions that generate knowledge. So if you ask me, you know, this decision support system, my dream is that we can help extension agents, advisors, you know, NGOs that are working with farmers, help them to use these decisions. Then they know how to translate that into action with farmers. Sitting in a university in New York, I will never be able to understand what farmers what problems farmers are facing. And so we need this, I don't know how we can call them the intermediaries, the extension agents, the people that are in between the knowledge and the use. And those actors are critical and we often overpass them. We feel so great by helping directly a farmer to make a change that we become very ineffective, very inefficient. It's critical that we understand and we work with this intermediary, with extension, with advisors, NGOs, etc. Thank you. And for for anyone who would like, whoop, question just got bounced. For um, anyone who would like to answer, one of the questions was, what are the biggest issues with data? interoperability and integration. Um, I'll, I can take a first step. I, I'll tell you our own experience. Uh, I, I really believe that especially now when every day is getting better, this is not a problem of software. This is not a problem of formats. This is not a problem of, you know, this is not a technical problem. The, the, the main problem that at least I found in 
interoperability and sharing is trust. When, when, when institutions know that, you know, the data that they have invested so much effort and money to produce, if they know that this is going to be well used, they're going to get the right credits. This is something they're never going to be ignored. You know, the, the sharing becomes a lot easier. I really believe that I can think of very few cases where the problem was technical. It's not interoperable because of format. It's not interoperable because, no, I mean, we have solutions for all of that. The key issue here is trust. And our experience, for example, with med services is that if we establish a relationship in which, you know, we help strengthening the capacities of the med service to develop better information, to develop more skillful forecasts, connect better with their user communities. If we establish that type of information, then sharing data becomes a lot easier. That, that is my experience. Bravo. I also would say that, for example, right now we have an embarrassment of riches when it comes to remote sensing data. We have four you know, we have two veers and two modises and two sentinels and two lands. I mean, we have so much data coming out of the sky. What we have is a severe lack of people who are ready to receive that information, as Walter says, right? So um, there are tons of tools, free ones, paid ones, smartphones, I mean, all sorts of stuff. But what we fail to do is to show how if you had perfect data, you can transform your, your decisions to make more money, right? So because we have such a giant amount of, the supply is so big, the everyone assumes, well, it's making a great difference. And I don't think it's really making a great difference because for the people who are most vulnerable, they have the least ability to make decisions. I think that um, one way we can really do a great job with data integration is to integrate the huge amounts of high quality satellite data into um, loan provision, into you know, giving much better support for families trying to do consumption support, uh, you know, all sorts of other um, uh, you know, sort of demand side creation. Because frankly, even if I had a perfect model, I could predict exactly what was going to happen with all diseases and pests in a place like Zambia. I would fail to get a lot of people to give me money for that information because it's just impossible to convince people that, you know, it, it really requires connection of the ability to make decisions, the decision and how the data will support that decision and then can, showing people how it will result in a better outcome, a more profitable agricultural season, basically. Thank you. And there's a, a question that was actually was answered in the in the in the chat, but I, I thought it was worth it just got bounced. Um thought it was worth um asking um, by John Cicitano, um saying that Surveyor seems to focus significantly on government entities you know, using Earth observation data for decision making. What are examples of how Surveyor is also engaging with the private sector? I think there is uh, some answer from Pete that there is some engagement in uh, Kenya and other countries where uh, crop uh, insurance companies are uh, engaged, uh, private insurance companies are engaged uh, with the survey programs. But in the Hindu Kush Himalayan region, we, uh, we are still looking uh, for some opportunities to engage with crop insurance uh, companies. So, so that's one of the area where we, we look forward to to, uh, to start engagement and and uh, make some headway.
Okay. Um, let's see. A question for Molly is that um, by from Casey Harrison. Micro insurance has been around for almost two decades. Um, could you describe some of the limit? Could you describe some of the limitations that may have prevented small farmers from adopting it? Right. I think the biggest limitation is the resolution of the information. So basically, you have a quarter hectare plot. That's a small farmer, yes. and the data that we're using to drive the index is at five kilometers. Right. So that guy on his little tiny field may experience dryness or, or a flood or a drought condition, which is totally failed to be captured at the five kilometer because of the spatial temporal mismatch, right? Because we all know that rainfall, the um, getting the information at the right, uh, getting the water at the right time for each growing growth phase is very important you can have, you know, six weeks of dry and your crops will be dead, even though the total amount of rainfall in this season is adequate. So we still have a long ways to go to make the satellite data capture the experience of each and every smallholder. Um, the other thing I would say is that there is still a significant weakness in the financial institutions, which are supported, which are supporting index insurance. And so I think a lot more people need insurance to do, cons you know, to basically support their, their consumption, their household consumption. In other words, people need insurance for things like school fees and for making sure they have enough food to eat and not just for agricultural production. So it's sort of, it, if it's more bundled with social protection, it would work a lot better and people would trust their ability to support their families in good years as well as in bad. So there's a large number of issues we have with index insurance, but this is why I think bundling index insurance with the products which are purchased by growers as well as in the broader social protection approach is a really interesting innovation. So we can capture and we can directly reimburse people for their direct loss at the same time um, work at a more sort of governmental scale. Thank you for that question. If I, if I may add, you know, to, so to, to those very important things that Molly just mentioned, right? The, 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 re, the relevance, the resolution of the product the readiness of the financial sector and being able to bundle these products. So those, to me, I completely agree. Those are three key issues. The other issue is in the meantime, right? When, when we still don't have this ability to produce the resolution needed, one, one thing that we realize is that uh, involving farmers from the very beginning, this is one of these pizza lessons, is, you know, you, you want to be sure that farmers understand what they're being insured for and what they're not being insured for. The, the worst thing that can happen in an insurance program is when you think you have a great insurance product and then farmers feel disappointed, feel like, you know, I had a big problem and the insurance didn't cover. And so we, we found that it, it you know, but I, I saw some uh, activities in PIX and in other, in other projects where with simple games involving you know farmers where you 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 start developing this con this notion of of the probability and the risk and how much are you willing to spend to cover this type of risk and you understand that if you pay less then you may not be a be covered and these exercises that are are amazingly good because then even when we know that our products are very imperfect because of resolution, because of not bundling, because of other place, other problems. In the meantime, we can still advance with this type of products. And the one problem that I found, or that I think we have on this type of activities is that you can reach very few farmers with this activity, right? Being very participatory then, it's very difficult to upscale, to go to the millions. And so now what we are doing is first, 
going back to what I was saying before, working a lot with the extension people, with the advisors, with uh, NGOs, so that they do this interaction with farmers, explain what insurance can cover and what insurance will not cover. And, and the other thing is taking advantage, I think that Molly was saying too, taking advantage of technology. Now, you know, it, it's amazing that the proportion of farmers that have smartphones. So then using those smartphones to, for example, report on damages, uh, uh, report on the situation today, that helps a lot to the people that are developing the insurance product to check. We don't have the right resolution with the image, but if we start getting reports from millions of farmers, then your product becomes better. So this crowdsourcing is something that can help a lot. And sorry, I would say I agree with uh, with a comment with a question that still has not been upscaling. But I'm I'm really happy to see, for example, Molly was mentioning R4. In, in Ethiopia, it's already more than a million farmers that are accessing to this type of insurance. So yes, we all want wish that it went faster, but it, I I think it it's starting to go up in a nice pace. And frankly, Walter, if it went up a lot faster, there would be a lot less ability of people to understand. There's a huge amount of socialization that has to happen. So, you know, it's sort of a two-edged sword. If you go from one to 100 million overnight, and then you have a big failure, then you're, you know, you're dead in the water. So be careful yeah. what you wish for, folks, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, there are um, there are several different kinds of questions about basically making um, these kinds of services available. So there's questions about how to get academic researchers to work with um, with development partners or to extend the results to the rest of the community. I'm just going to just jump to one more question and also um, making them available to um, to professional pharma organizations. So do you have do you have examples or suggestions about um, extending access at these different levels? So I, I would like to make a short comment on that, Barbara, because it's something that is very strong in my heart. And that is we are in I work for a university, right? So we are educating people that that are going to be interacting with developing agencies, with NGOs, with extension people. And I really don't like what I'm seeing. You know, the way that a professional advances in career is by being uh, evaluated by their own peers who are working in exactly the same the speciality that they're working. So we're, we're becoming better and better in smaller and smaller issues. If we want to inform development, we need to integrate and we need to promote that universities, uh, you know, stimulate the formation of people that are integrators. Now a people, a person that is an integrator is not very respected in the scientific community. Now we are we are we are witnessing a stronger and stronger pressure to be socially relevant. Science has to inform the decisions. Science has to have a re, uh, an important impact on society. That needs integrator. We still need the people that are working in very specialized fields, but we need people that can integrate all this discipline, all this knowledge and convert it into something that is useful, usable, actionable. And that is something that we at the university have to promote. We are not promoting strong enough. We are talking about transdisciplinary, talking about all these concepts. We have to do it. We have to really do it. Would anyone, that seems like a, a great final comment, and I'm wondering whether anyone else would like to, um, End with a with a, a final comment. Sure, I will say that there is a huge amount of opportunity to use satellite data for improving decision making. 
And what we need is more innovation to better understand how to deliver the data in ways which are innovative. We have just scarcely started. Um, you know, this is actually one reason, Walter, that I am also working with Sixth Grain, a corporation, because we move so much faster than the academic world. I mean, it's quick, right? So we we try something out, and if it doesn't work, we shift and we change, and we're always looking for new things. And it is so exciting to work across the corporate uh, sector because, you know, agriculture, it's not a volunteer activity. Everyone's trying to make money from soup to nuts, right? So it is, if you can't bring value, that's it, you're done. So I really think we have, we're the beginning of a new era. And I think satellite derived rainfall, vegetation data can be transformative, but we still haven't figured out how to do it. So we really need your help to help us do that. That's all I have. What, is, it, is anyone else interested in making a final comment? If not, we're just about we're over time. So, yeah, I can just add like, uh, but, um, Molly uh, 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 talked about the innovation. So what we are experiencing here is the simplicity. So if we can make a simple product workable, like it is simple to understand, and uh, we can put in operation into existing functions, I think that probably we have seen more adoptability and uh, effectiveness of those. Like while it is exciting to talk, uh, to talk about innovation and some complexity in algorithms, but we have what we have seen with the national government, national institutions, that simple thing. If simple things can be put in operation, they can make uh, the CN making more robust, and uh, and adoption is the key. If we we can uh, make those uh, products or information adopted in the existing system, that's the only way to to make them useful. All right, thank you. Um, a huge thanks to the panelists. And I wanted to end by saying that this event was part of a month-long series on AgriLinks on Earth Observation for Food Security and Agriculture, the Climate Edition. That was for October 2021. On the AgriLinks site, you can find more resources about similar uh, kinds of cutting edge work. And a huge thanks to to the to the panelists, to AgriLinks, and uh, most of all to the audience for all the work that you also are doing. Thank you, and um, stay safe, everyone. Bye. Good day. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Very